Good morning and Merry Christmas, Lakeshore Community Fellowship. It's Pastor Josiah coming to you from my home office. I hope you're enjoying your Christmas morning with your family, that you have your maybe your Christmas jammies on, your hot coffee, whatever it is. I'm glad we can, at the very least, dive into God's Word together this morning. Even though we're not uh, with one another in person, I'm glad we're able to still meet virtually like this. You know, in the story we're looking at this morning, it's about sharing good news. And that's something we can all identify with, right? There's been times where all of us have good news to share. You know, I personally remember when Benny or Silas was born, calling my parents and needing to share that news with them. You know, how exciting it was. When we have good news, it can't be contained. You know, we're going to explode if we don't share it. And what we have in the Christmas story in Luke 2 is heaven not being able to contain the good news that they have. No, heaven explodes into our reality in sharing the good news about the birth of Jesus. The biggest idea associated with Jesus and Christianity is the message of Jesus. You know, this message is called the gospel. And Luke uses the opening historical story to illustrate its meaning. And if I had to kind of condense this all together. You know, the whole point of this message to just one statement, I would express it this way. The greatness of the gospel is the glory of God's grace. I'll say that again. The greatness of the gospel is the glory of God's grace. And I'll show you why as we jump into Luke 2 together. I'll be reading from verses 1 to 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there is no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So we have this amazing story, the Christmas story. You know, and the idea of a message coming from heaven may not immediately strike you with a sense of joy and excitement. You know, most of the religious messages you or I have heard focus on what you need to do. You know, and none of us like that, right? Like, great, another list of things I need to do. By calling the message of Jesus a gospel, the focus isn't all on what you have to do. The focus is on what God has done and how it now impacts your life. The word gospel means the announcement, life-changing good news. It is to announce an event that creates a new life situation. It's a life-altering and changing good news. And if you look at this story, the gospel according to Jesus isn't like any good news ever pronounced ever. It's in its own category. You know, Jesus' gospel is great. The angels, the angels themselves say good news of great joy. You know, mega or great is the word they use. The greatness of the gospel is immediately seen in three things. And the first is its source. You know, it's pronounced by angels, which means that the source of this message doesn't just come from random dudes. It comes from God. The gospel of Jesus originated with God. It's not a human creation. And when you come to understand it, you'll realize that no one could have made this up. It's the total opposite of every religion ever known to man. 
You know, every religion is telling you all the good things you need to do to get to heaven. The gospel is telling you that God descended down to save you, that he came to get you, not you working to get to him. The next thing we see about the greatness of the gospel is its scope. It's good news for every people group ever. It's not just for Jewish people. It's not just for the the Middle East. It's for all peoples. And this news impacts all peoples at all times. That's why this message is still relevant even thousands of years later. And the angels recognize this by saying peace to men. Not just peace to some men, but to all men. It includes all people of all times. And the last part of the greatness of the gospel is its subject. The gospel message tells us three things about this child. First, he is the Christ, which means the Messiah, the anointed king. Only the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, can you understand how significant a statement this is? You know, in the Old Testament, we're told that God would raise up a super king, a king of kings, who would usher in God's eternal kingdom. But there's more to that. This Messiah is also the Lord. And this title is used of God in the Old Testament. What was whispered in the Old Testament, you know, the Messiah's identity, is now shouted in the New Testament, that the child is the Lord God himself. We also see that he is the Savior, and this means to rescue from danger or disaster. And the word is not only saying something about Jesus, it's saying something about us, the human race. And what this means is it implies that the human race is in mortal danger, that we we are needing to be saved. And the two realities we're needing to be saved from are human sinfulness and divine holiness. You know, human sinfulness in the sense that all of us are born into sin, all of us fall short. It's not just about moralism. It's just about the fact that we have a sinful nature and divine holiness in the sense that God is holy and just and he needs to move against us in judgment. You know, there's so much more I could say about this, but but we all feel this deep down. You know, this is why the most common expression that's ex- uh, most common emotion that's expressed when people encounter God is fear, a fear of judgment. The reason why the angels can say, don't be afraid, is because Jesus has been born to be your savior, to rescue you from sin and judgment. You don't need to be afraid anymore. Jesus' gospel is great because he is God who has come to rescue you from sin and judgment. His person and work has created a new situation in our world. And when you accept and believe it, it will utterly change your life. And these are all the reasons why Jesus' gospel is great. But there's a reason for its greatness that underlies all other reasons. And it's the reason of reasons. The greatness of the gospel is the glory of God's grace. And the, and the reason why I use those words together to describe the greatness of the gospel is because they come right out of the text that we're in. The word glory is an important word used in this story. You know, it, it appears three times in chapter 2, verse 9, 14, and 20. But glory is also an important word in the Bible as a whole. And it's almost exclusively used in reference to God. So, so what does this word mean? Glory in reference to God means the visible manifestation of God's invisible beauty. It's the beauty of his attributes made visible. In the Old Testament, God is sometimes revealed as a brilliant light or a fire. Since God is spirit in nature, we can't see him in our physical realm. Glory is God making his invisible nature visible. If you look at Exodus 33, Moses asked God if he could see his glory. And God tells him, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name. God's glory here is expressed as the beauty of God's goodness. So if glory is God putting the beauty of his goodness on display so that we can actually see it and know it, this story is telling us that God is ultimately displaying his goodness through his grace. In uh, chapter 2 verse 14 it reads, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angels are glorifying God because of his favor, his grace on men. In Christ, God is saying, behold my goodness, look at my goodness. And then the angels and shepherds respond by saying, wow, you are good. Grace is an amazing word. And it's most clearly understood when it's contrasted with two other words, justice and mercy. Justice is God giving you what you don't deserve. Or you know, justice is God giving you what you deserve. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. God gives you salvation, not because you are deserving, but because he is gracious. You know, that's the glory of his grace. We see the glory of grace in two things. You know, who he saves and how he saves. And when we look at who he saves... 
The angels appear from heaven with history and life-changing news. And who are they sent to? Shepherds. You know, they're sent to shepherds. And we really sanitize this view of shepherds, right? We kind of imagine, you know, these guys in beautiful, clean clothes. And they're out with the sheep. And it's so, it's so pretty and perfect. But that's not the reality, right? Shepherds had a bad reputation. They were considered unreliable. They weren't allowed to give testimony in court. They were ceremonial, ceremonially unclean, so they couldn't participate in religious ceremonies. You know, that was a big deal. They were looked down upon and were considered outcasts. And so if you lived during that day and you had to think of the most undeserving kind of person, you would say a shepherd. What God's telling you is in giving shepherds the incredible privilege of receiving the good news, it shows us that salvation is offered not because you are good, at or good or deserving, but because God is gracious and generous. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God has sent his son into the world to save you, to offer salvation to you. And we also see how God saves. Now, do you see that the glory and beauty of God's grace and how he saves you? Do you notice that it's not the shepherds who go looking for God, but God went looking for them. The story of your salvation is the same as mine. You didn't pursue God. God pursued you. And the entire incarnation is about God coming into this world. God coming into this world to come looking for you, to seek and save what is lost. And there's a lot of irony in the angel's words in this story. You know, they're essentially saying God himself has come into this world. And if you had to put those words together, what would you think? You know, we can often think of the revelation, revelation picture of Jesus coming, right? A warrior king on a horse with a blazing sword. But the angels say this, you know, this is how you're going to recognize this Messiah. You know, he's a baby. He's wrapped in a manger. So here is God made flesh as a baby, vulnerable, needing to be wrapped in clothes, lying in a, in a food trough. Like, really? That's how God is coming into the world? And in fact, they say this picture is a sign. And what does this mean? What, what is this sign telling us? If God came in blazing fly, in fire in all his glory, you would think, he's coming to kill me. But God coming as a baby means something else. He hasn't come to slay you. He's come to save you. Jesus came as a human baby to share in your humanity. He came in weakness to share your weakness. He came rejected as an outcast to share in your alienation from God. He came in poverty to share your poverty. He came to take your place, to become you before God and experience God's judgment and rejection so that you can be accepted. Jesus took your place of sin so that you can take his place of righteousness. So how do you respond to this? Again, we have this amazing news here in the Bible. How do we actually respond to the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus? And let's look at what the shepherds did, because their response is so fitting and accurate, right? You see, they simply received and believed in the message. And throughout the New Testament, this is the response God's looking for to his gospel. Receive it as though done for you, and believe in it as God's revealed truth as to how you're saved. That you're not saved because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And I want you to notice how the shepherds expressed their faith. And I want you to maybe consider how you might express your faith in the gospel in the same way. We see that they're seeking. In chapter 2.15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. They went looking for Jesus. They found him and then they knew Jesus. As an expression of faith, make seeking Christ and knowing him the biggest thing in your life. You know, in Philippians 3.8, consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. We also see that the shepherds shared the gospel of Jesus. In chapter 2, verse 17, it reads, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told uh, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They spread the word. And so if you really believe in the life-changing good news of Jesus, you won't be able to contain it. You're going to have to share it with other people. If we really believe that people are in mortal danger, and if we really believe that Jesus came to save them, then how can we not be willing to share it? It's not your responsibility to save them. Only God can do that. But it is your responsibility. It's your God-given privilege to share the good news with them. And lastly, and we see in chapter 2, verse 20, they served. 
It reads this in chapter 2, verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They returned, glorifying and praising God. If you really believe God did this incredible work in saving you, how can you not thank him and praise him? And the most simple response to God's awesome display of grace is, thank you. Thank you. It's true that seeking, sharing, and serving are true of other religions, but there's a big difference in Christianity. You don't do these things to gain God's acceptance and blessing. It's because you have God's acceptance and blessing unconditionally through grace that you willingly do these things as an expression of changed and grateful heart. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Lord, for all the families who are watching this message. Lord, as as we take away the gospel of Jesus on our hearts, Lord, that our response would be the same as the shepherds. Lord, that we would believe it. Lord, that we would receive it. That we would say thank you, God, and that we would share this good news with all we come into contact with. Lord, that this Christmas we would be focused on the greatest gift of all that we've received, and that is your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, and that we would share this news with everyone. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Have a Merry Christmas, and I will see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. New Year's Day at the link. Have a great Christmas.